Yes. I think it's doing some amplification, but it's not quite as ringy in your ears. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. I know it's a beautiful Sunday, and there are a lot of things that you can be doing rather than coming here and listening to a candidate. But I want to tell you how important it is for those of us who are running for office that folks like you engage in your community, that you will engage with us, that you will participate in the process, because we are a republic. And the only way that we can represent you is if we're able to come and talk to you, engage with you, discuss with you the issues that are important, and actually have an opportunity to have a dialogue. And I think that that's something that has been missing for quite some time in, in Wyoming as well as other places. And I want to tell you that one of the things that I've heard as I've campaigned across this, this great state over the last 14 months is how important accountability is. I understand that you are looking for someone who goes back to Washington, D.C., who represents your interests, represents Wyoming, and will be accountable to you by coming to events like this. I would like to tell you that I know how many times I've been in Newcastle so far, but I don't know. <laughs> because it's been a lot. Um, and it's been every place in the state of Wyoming, a lot. We are at almost 50,000 miles in 14 months, crossing every single highway. We have covered every highway in the state of Wyoming, except for one section between Casey and Lynch, and another section uh, west of here, out towards your ranch. We came in from um, Pine Haven one day, came south on that highway, instead of going west over to right, we came east back towards Newcastle. So that little section of the road are the only two roads that we have not covered. So I feel a little bit inadequate, but we'll get them nice <laughs> Emily 
Kelly, thank you for everything that you did helping us to get geared up to do this. You have been just such a great friend, and I love you and love your family and, and everything that you guys do for this community. It's so nice to see you tonight and all of the people that I've had the opportunity to get to know over the last year. There's a couple of things that I want to tell you that are going to be priorities for me. And Alan, you, you are now uh, going to be elected on Tuesday to an incredibly incredibly important position, much more so than mine, because I'm going to spend my time in Congress trying to take all of the power out of Washington, D.C. and returning it to the states where it belongs. Yeah. We, need, we need good conservative legislators. We need good conservative county commissioners. I know you're here. We need good conservative leaders in all of our communities. <coughs> Because the fact is, for far too long, we've been stockpiling far too much power in D.C., and we are all paying the price that's for right. it. So, Alan, there's going to be a lot that's going to happen over the next two years, and there's going to be some pretty serious responsibility put on our states. We are going to retake the House on Tuesday. The Republicans are going to retake the House. We're going to have 235 to 240 seats. If it's a great night, it may be even more than that. I also believe we're going to retake the Senate yep. by a couple of seats. We won't have the White House, but what we can do is we can block the Biden uh, uh, legislative agenda. Yeah. We can at least block the legislative agenda. But you all know that a badger is the most dangerous when you're getting cornered. And at that point, they're going to try to do everything by executive order, guidance document, and regulation. And this is where you guys come in. Our states are going to have to step up, and you're going to have to sue over everything that comes out of that administration. You're going to have to sue when the Department of Agriculture says that they are going to withhold school lunch money unless we adopt radical gender ideology. You're going to have to sue. You're going to have to sue as they demand that our schools adopt more and more nonsense such as CRT. You're going to have to sue over this 30 by 30 plan. You're going to have to keep filing lawsuits. And I know I'm an attorney, and everybody hates attorney, attorneys, and you all think that's always your answer to everything. It is the answer to everything right now, because it's the only chance we have of stopping the lawlessness that we know is going, will be happening the moment that the Republicans retake the House. At that point, the, the Biden, will, Biden agenda will only go forward unconstitutionally and unlawfully, and the only way we can block it is if states step forward and start fighting back. And I'm going to give you an example of what I mean. If the state of Wyoming does not get involved in these lawsuits, then if we are, if in another state, say Arkansas or Mississippi or Texas, if they file over something that the Biden administration has done wrong and get an injunction, that injunction won't apply in Wyoming unless Wyoming is a party. So several years ago, I represented the Water, the Wyoming Association of Conservation Districts, and we filed a lawsuit in North Dakota challenging the Obama WOTUS rule, the Waters of the U.S. rule. We got an injunction, but that injunction only applied in the 13 states that were involved in that lawsuit. 37 states in this country were required to go forward and implement the unlawful Obama WOTUS rule. We don't want that for all of these things. And the reason I keep talking about this is that we have to convince our governor and our attorney general that they've got to step it up. They need to step it up and they've got to protect our state. And they can't just say, oh, it's okay because Louisiana's taking care of that or Mississippi's taking care of that or Connecticut's taking care of that. The state of Wyoming needs to engage and they need to fight back and they need to push back. We are or are allegedly the reddest state in the nation, and we should be fighting every bad policy that comes out of this administration. Amen. And I want to make sure that I'm working with the legislature to identify what those lawsuits are and what we need to do to fight back. So I want to work very, very closely with our legislators for many reasons. Number one, I think our congressional delegation should. Don't you? Yes, yes. Don't you think that our congressional uh, delegation, our, our, uh, our House member and our senators, don't you think that they should be engaging on almost a daily basis?
basis or a weekly basis, whatever is necessary with our elected officials so that we know what we need to do. And you also know what's coming down from Washington, D.C. I think it's very important that we have that interaction, and I intend to make sure that I do that. I've gotten to know Alan over the years. We've become good friends. Uh, my family members are good friends with them. Uh, Sherry Steinmetz, your senator, has been a good friend of mine since high school. We have great relationships. We need to exploit them and make sure that we're using them appropriately for the benefit of the state of Wyoming. Mm -hmm. So one of the other things that I intend to do, and I've talked to a lot of leaders back in Washington to see about already, is that Congress has got to stop abdicating its responsibilities for actually legislating. For too long, we have turned over our legislative responsibilities to unelected bureaucrats. And as a result, we have $32 trillion in debt. We have a runaway bureaucracy that is not accountable to anybody. You have an FBI that is completely lawless at this point in time. You've got a Department of Education that is not educating students. They are indoctrinating them. We have a Department of Energy that is trying to destroy our energy infrastructure. We have an EPA that's trying to destroy our farmers and our ranchers and our coal companies and our oil and gas companies all because Congress has let the unelected bureaucrats rule. And we've got to stop that now. Yeah. We are going to have to change the trajectory of this country. We have to change where we're going. We are running out of runway. I look at this beautiful young man back there. He deserves to have as much freedom as when growing up as I had growing up. We're not going to let this fall on our watch. We're going to protect him, we're going to protect our country, we're going to protect our future, and we're going to make sure that we are changing what is happening in this country. I am not going back there to protect the status quo. I am not going back there to get along with everybody, even though I'm very easy to get along with. As long as you do what I want you to do. I am not going back there to be a friend of the people who have created the, created the mess that we're in. I am going back there because I have heard very loud and clear from the people of Wyoming that we need a change. Yeah. I won't go back to protect the status quo because the status quo is untenable. It is no longer, we cannot survive as a country with open borders, with the war on our energy industry, with the war on common sense, with the war on small businesses, with the war on our health care. We cannot survive as a country when you have the kind of people in D.C. who have been making the decisions that they've been making. We have to make some dramatic changes. And I'm going to tell you something. I think that I am going to be part of a red wave that the people in Washington, D.C. are going to recognize that things are going to change. I'll give you an example. And I've been asked this question about Kevin McCarthy. Are you going to support him for speaker? To my knowledge, he's the only person running for speaker. Do you not want to know what he's doing? He put somebody like Jim Jordan in charge. He's going to be the head of the Judiciary Committee. Jim Jordan is going to be the head of the Judiciary Committee. He is going to be the one that takes on the bureaucracy. He is going to be the one that has the ability to call these people to task. And he's asked me to be on that Judiciary Committee as well. And we're, uh, and we're going to call these people in and we're going to demand that they give us answers. And if they don't give us answers, we're going to do everything in our power to get them fired. Yeah. <laughs> with our CF, C, CIA, with the FISA court, with these various, the, the EPA, again, the Department of Energy who's trying to destroy our, our ability to produce energy in this country. When you look at what they've done, when you look at what Mayorkas has done, completely destroyed our ability to prevent people from entering this country illegally. When you look at people who were put in positions of power and the only thing that they've done is try to destroy our country, then they need to be held to account. Yeah. And we're going to do it. We're going to do it. So I'm excited to get back there. I'm excited about the other people that I have met who are also going to be back there. I've not only been campaigning around Wyoming, I've also been campaigning around the country. Because I can't do this alone. I'm going to be one of 435 people, and I know that. But I have to have allies. I have to have like-minded people who are elected. I have so far traveled and campaigned for people in North Carolina, Iowa, Arizona, Oklahoma, Tennessee, New York, Connecticut, uh, and, and, and numerous places in Florida. Just in the last week, 
I went to most of those places. And we have been campaigning for people, and I'm going to tell you something. There is a lot of excitement with what is going on right now around the entire country. In Connecticut, we may pick up as many as three seats. Oh Connecticut. Wow. wow. We're going to probably get four seats in Florida. We're picking up as many as three seats in Oregon. <laughs> out of the governor's office in Michigan. Yeah. And when we want a garden, we're going to garden, yeah. regardless of whether we have COVID or not. <laughs> we're also going to bring Anthony Fauci before the Judiciary Committee. Yeah. I went to a rally the other night for Lee Zeldin in New York. Oh. And it was wild. <laughs> It was so wild. The excitement, the, the atmosphere, it was electrifying. It was such an incredible experience to be able to do that because, again, even in New York, they're fed up. They're fed up with what's happened with their state. They're fed up with their political leaders. They're fed up with the crime. They're fed up with the energy costs and the inflation. And they're not going to put up with it anymore. And if they're willing to make a change, if they're willing to come along with us, the fact is, this is a huge red wave across this country. We're going to be making some changes. We need just a couple of things. And I've been saying over and over again most recently, we kind of need to get back to some basics. We need to get back to the ABCs. We need to be accountable. We need to be bold. And we need to be courageous. Yes. Because the times are calling for it. We've got to be all three of those, and I will be. When I go back to Washington, D.C., I will represent you. I will represent Wyoming, and I will make sure that we are doing what is necessary to protect our country from the onslaught that we have seen the last 20 to 30 years who want to turn us into just another failed state. We're not going to do that. This truly is the greatest country in the history of the world. We have the greatest governing document ever written. All we need to do is follow its dictates. We don't have to do anything else. It's kind of funny because this is, I think, my last event of the last 14 months, and I'm finally losing my voice. <laughs> Timing is everything. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, with that, what I would like to do is I'd like to open it up to questions and comments and advice and suggestions. So many of you have been with me from the beginning on this. I met you over a year ago. I've had the opportunity to come up here and have dinner with you. I met some of you four years ago. I've been able to work with, uh, with Carrie in terms of the, the state GOP, and you've been absolutely a rock star in terms of your representation of this county and the work that you do. So... Fabulous. You're going to be absolutely fabulous when you get down to the legislature. I look forward to working with you. And again, I'm just going to open it up for questions and comments and whatever else you want to give me. Any questions? Yes. I guess I'm curious um, about the Chinese acquiring land next to our Air Force bases. Um, yeah. just kind of following the Grand Forks, North Dakota issue where they wanted to do a grain milling facility. It's a terrible idea. But now they're trying to get acquired property by Warren Air Force Base in Wyoming. I, I'm sure that they're trying everywhere that they can. We know that. Uh, they, have, they already control one of our main packing plants. That's Smithfield. Uh, but we, do you think we could buy land in China? No. No. Do you think we, the United States government could really even buy land in France? or England, or Paraguay, I mean, it, it, it's not even possible, yet we're allowing other countries to come into our country and do that. And I think, again, it's been people who've been asleep at the wheel, who haven't thought through the, the potential threats associated with it. So there needs to be a, 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 we need to put a stop to that. I believe there have been some bills introduced to that very effect. Um, I, I don't support it. We need to push back against it. We're in a soft war with China from the standpoint of what they're doing, the fentanyl that, they're, that they are just flooding our southern border with. We've lost 120,000 people in the last year to fentanyl overdoses, the vast majority of which originates in China. Uh, what they've done in the South China Sea, Japan, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, they're all learns about what has been going on with China. 
And it's part of the problem that you have with the current administration is they pretty much failed at everything that is good for the country. I'm not going to say that they failed at pushing forward their agenda. They've done that. They have failed at doing what was right. And one of them is addressing the threat that China poses to us. I'm not a foreign policy expert. I don't know everything yet. I don't know what we would need to do in terms of changing our laws to prevent a foreign country from owning real property. Uh, or what we would need to do to look at what they own right now, but it's something that I'm absolutely committed to looking into to see if we can stop it. I have so many <laughs> buffer zones around our military bases, our air there force are, bases. There, there are buffer zones. In fact, I've, I've had some battles about buffer zones over the years. Okay. Uh, and the reason that I say that is it's in my opinion that the federal government should own the, should own the property, but then they don't get to control private property, dictating what private landowners can do by using bigger and bigger and bigger buffer, buffer zones. And that's something that our Department of Defense has in fact done. And so I'm opposed to China owning land, but I'm also a huge advocate for private property rights. And if the federal government needs this much for their for their their their, their, their uh, military installation, they shouldn't be able to take the room in order to do that. And if they do, they have to pay compensation for it. And that's the battle: is they attempt to control what private individuals, citizens of this country, do with their land by buffer zones. So that's just something that we have to keep in mind. That's a completely different issue than the issue with China. That's a very, very different issue than the issue with China. Yeah, I see it definitely as a security risk. I no mean, question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I just wouldn't want to see that happen in Wyoming. I, I don't think it should be happening in North Dakota. No, <laughs> no. We need to, we need to be watching it. So, other questions? Yes, ma'am. Is it true that Hillary Clinton, when she was uh, Secretary of State, that did she mortgage? our federal lands to China for the bailout money? Well, you know, the fact is that China is heavily invested in our country because we have $32 trillion in debt and they own a lot of it. So whether she specifically did that, I will tell you what she did. She was involved with the Russians taking over the, um, uh, the, the uranium that was right here in Wyoming. Did you know that that mine was here in Wyoming? That is, that's one of our uranium assets she sold to Russia, but it has been reacquired. It has been redomesticated. Russia no longer owns that particular uranium operation, but she did, she did sell it to him while she was Secretary of State. She did a lot of really bad things. I think it's one of the things we need to find out a lot more about. Uh, one of the things I've always talked about about the Clintons is not only what they've done in terms of the damage and the poli for the policies to our country, they were really the first presidency to monetize the presidency. Um, if Jimmy Carter's or Gerald Ford's or Richard Nixon's kids walk through that door right now, you wouldn't recognize them. But you all know who uh, uh, Chelsea Clinton is. She, and then we know Hunter, what's happened with Hunter Biden. Well, it was the Clintons that, that, that uh, did the roadmap for how to monetize, monetize the presidency and vice presidency for people like Hunter Biden. So they've done a lot of damage to this country and need to be held account for what they've done. You know, just what we're in the battle that, that uh, Donald Trump is fighting right now over the archives. Yet we know that Hillary Clinton's laptop and her homebrew server and all of those things, she was never held accountable for any of that. Uh, all of those things need to be looked into. So yes, right here. With us taking back, hopefully, the, the House and the Senate, one of the things that I believe is super critical, and many people do, that Trump started is how do we get our our, our, our border secure again and stop the, the crisis that we have down south and stop elites crossing the border because it affects our voting, it affects everything that we do. What can we do at a local level first? But what can the House and the Senate do to get that crisis stopped? So one of the things we can do is we can block the legislative agenda. But as you know, that's not coming through any legislative agenda. I do know one of the first people we're going to drag before our committee is my orcas. And to, find him and to hold him accountable for what he has done in completely failing
So that's one of the things that we have to do is, is expose what has actually gone on. When I talk to other candidates and I explain to them that my state has 580,000 people and that we've had more than four times the population of Wyoming illegally cross that border in the last two years, that's a metric that really brings it home to them of the magnitude of what this is. It's going to affect all of our schools. We've got over 160 countries that have come across illegally from that across that border. We all know that we have to provide, you know, in our schools. It, it affects our budgets. It affects Medicare. It affects our hospitals. It affects our our housing. It affects jobs. It it has such an incredible compounding effect for every illegal alien that comes in. I don't know what we can do. And I'm not saying that by saying there isn't anything to do. What I'm telling you is I don't know enough about what all the tools are that we may have, whether it's a federal <coughs> spending bill. It says we're not going to give you this money to fund the Department of Education unless we get 400 miles of, of wall built. I don't know what all of our tools are to try to get better control of that border. And so I don't have an answer for you today, and I'm not just saying that I don't think there's anything we can do. I think there's stuff we can do. I think that we can help the states. I think that Arizona and Texas uh, are, fat, are fighting this battle, and we can find ways to help them. Um, so I think that there are a variety of tools, but one of the things I learned, and I didn't know this, and this is again out of ignorance, since Nancy Pelosi took the gavel two years ago, this is the worst it's pretty much ever been in Washington, D.C., that the majority part party has completely 100% excluded the minority party from participating at all. So when we're in power, the minority party can bring amendments to bills, and they have the ability to do things in committee. They have changed the rules so that the minority party, the Republicans right now, have zero voice, zero voice in Congress. And that's the way that she has implemented that to prevent the Republicans from even bringing an amendment so that we could show what we can do to make people's lives better. They've blocked that. I have a question. My question is, why in the world is nothing being done, as far as my viewpoint, to release all the people that have been held since January 6th. It is corrupt. Because I had family there and it was basically peaceful, thousands, million people there until they saw BLM people with hats on, saw guards opening doors and went, come on in. And then the death of that young woman. The current January 6th committee needs to be abolished. It needs to be yeah. completely done. This is not an investigative committee. It is a propaganda committee. They're not looking at what happened. They're attempting to present a narrative and write a story. That's why they hired Hollywood to help them do it. So we need to get rid of that. But what we really do need to do is find out what did happen on January 6th. Release the 14,000 hours of videotape to show exactly what you're saying, that the vast, vast majority of people didn't do anything at all. But what we also need to see is when the barricades were moved, who moved them, why you had people waving people into the Capitol. We need a lot more information. What has happened to the people who have been accused of committing a crime on January 6th is absolutely a violation of the Fifth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment and the Eighth Amendment to the United States Constitution. As I've said, Nancy Pelosi has erased the Republicans' ability to be involved in anything when it comes to Congress right now. Those rules change as of January 3rd. Mm -hmm. And we will have the ability to find out and see what we can do. I don't know what the answers are there either. I don't know what they are. But I can tell you that it violates, it absolutely violates the concept of due process and equal protection to hold somebody in jail for 18 months without ever charging them with a crime, especially when you're talking about a misdemeanor. Yeah, yeah, it's especially. Yes, back here. You want to come? Let me just start holding some of these people accountable. I'm just slapping them on the wrist. This is FBI people, people in government and whatnot. We, we look around us, ourselves, and we hold people accountable for all these things. 
that needs to come back in, and that would start straightening a lot of this out. I agree. I agree. David Bernhardt, who was the, the Secretary of Interior under uh, Donald Trump, has put together a really good roadmap for civil service reform so that when people do things, you can hold them accountable and they can actually be held accountable. They can lose their jobs, whatever it may be. I think personally that probably some need to have more repercussions than just losing their jobs. Yep. But I, we, we have to see what we can do when I get back there and when we have... The thing about the freshman class that is coming in is that we all come from being out here talking to you. And it doesn't matter whether I'm talking to somebody, a candidate in Tennessee, or North Carolina, or Iowa, or Arizona. We're all hearing the same thing. You have said the same thing that I have heard across the entire United States over and over and over and over again. And that is the message that we're taking back to Washington, D.C. with us. Yes, ma'am. What's the appetite like with the other uh, congressmen, their freshman class, whatever? for um, <clears throat> taking, holding money out of the FBI and the IRS and just choking them down because that, that's, how they, that's how they survive. They have too much money and too much corruption. So it was interesting to me, this last week, the travels that I was doing was with Steve Scalise, who is the current minority whip, and he will be the party leader uh, after Tuesday. And we were talking about that. And I was talking about the, the power of the first and the budgeting process. And it has been a long time since they have actually done the budget process pursuant to what's required by the Constitution. They do the budget by continuing resolutions and omnibus spending bills and a lot of gimmicks. When they do that, they continue to fund these agencies at exactly the same level or a higher level than they were before. And I said, we have got, the Congress has got to start using the power of the purse to limit the power and authority and the abusiveness of these agencies. And he said, in 1974, Congress gave away much of its authority to actually use the budget in that way. And I said, I wasn't familiar with that. I didn't know that. And so I texted him after we got off the airplane and I said, would you please send me that information? And he did, it's, in my, it's a text message in my phone. But I said, um, why don't we repeal that? And he said, huh. <laughs> <laughs> Idea. He said, I said, can we repeal that? And he said, yeah. He said, we could when we get the presidency too. And I said, well, we, I think we need to start working towards that. Because what I hear a lot of is people say, we need to have a balanced budget amendment. We need to change our constitution to have a balanced budget amendment. I'm not saying that I'm opposed to that, but before we do that, why don't we fix some of the things that have prevented us from budgeting and actually using the power of the purse as it's intended by our founders Rather than going in, we don't have to go down the road of doing a constitutional amendment. Change the law that exists now that prevents us from doing what we're supposed to be doing. I think the absolute key, the absolute key to getting control of government is using the power of the purse to these agencies and when they do things wrong. Why is the, why is the USDA issuing a guidance document that says you either adopt radical gender ideology or we're, we're going to withhold $40 million of lunch money? Who gave the USDA the legal authority to do that? Well, most, I, I'll tell you the answer. Congress. Nobody. Yeah. They don't have the authority to do that. These are the kinds of things that the state of Wyoming has got to sue on and stop listening to the people who say, oh, we can't fight that. We can't. Yeah, you can. Yes, we can. We can fight that nonsense. The USDA has absolutely no legal authority to define a boy as a girl or a girl as a boy. There's nothing that allows them to do that. So why would we allow them to implement a policy? If they're going to do that, then let's take money away from them. First of all, don't let them do it. Second of all, they've obviously got too much money because they're wasting time on an awful lot of nonsense. Corruption. Corruption. So we have to get back to Congress actually using the power of the purse to dictate policy. That's why our forefathers gave it to them. Over 
One thing about it is I'm pretty sick and tired of Chinese. Does anybody in this room that would probably do support the Chinese? Fine. But I don't. And one thing I'm sick and tired of, I have worked with corporate America for a lot of years. And I had to put up with them all, all the time. In fact, we're in love. I wish I was not very popular in the government. But anyway, I think we need to be strict. You think we need to be strict with Chinese? The Confucius Institute is one of the ways in which they've said it repeatedly that they have been able to infiltrate our universities and that's why you see the arrests that you do every once in a while. I don't disagree with you. Um, I think that it's something that is absolutely imperative. One of the things is foreign policy is largely left to the executive branch. But again, you know, I'm an America first candidate. I'm an America first person, I'm, an, I'm a Wyoming first candidate. And we have got to start recognizing that we are, uh, we're, we're losing the information war, if you will, with China. We need to have our political leaders understand the threat. The people that I talk to do. Our current executive branch is filled with people who are not the brightest lights on the porch. <laughs> and that's like, that's not funny. Actually, we're, we're, they're filled with people who, who don't believe in America first. They, they are not America first people. And they either don't recognize the threat that China poses or they don't necessarily care. And that has to change. We haven't had that for some time. Yes, they have. We've been 20 years. Yes, they have. Mm -hmm. well, yes. I've got a follow-up question to that in the same genre. We have an awful lot of people in Congress, in federal Congress, that have extremely tight ties to China, like Elena Chow and her husband. Mitch McConnell. Are you in a position to be able to investigate those people? I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, so I do, I agree with you. It gets exposed every day. We read about it in the newspaper. Everybody in this room has read about it. And it, there's very serious questions as to the extent to which they're compromised. We know Hunter Biden is. We know that Hunter Biden is. We all question to what extent foreign policy is being dictated by Joe Biden's crackhead son. Um, we're all worried about that. And that's some of the things. I mean, it's a, it's there's a lot of problems back in Washington, D.C. And that's one of them. Well, part of my the reason, the thrust behind my question is obviously we have a lot of rhinos. I don't like that term. Let's just say non America first types. And one of them, of course, just happens to be the, the minority Senate lead. And can we go after somehow those people and at least expose to the, the public more about what's going on? Now, we, some of us actually know that we, we do studies on that sort of stuff. But to me, it's a very serious issue because, especially with the possibility of us going to war with China, we need to know what's happening within our own house. And unfortunately, a lot of that is on the Republican side. I, I don't disagree with you. I don't disagree with you. The way I refer to them is I don't use the word right. For DC, I use the word uniparty. And there's a lot of Republicans and Democrats in Washington, D.C. that do not care who's in power, just so long as they are. And I think that that's been demonstrated uh, repeatedly, especially in just the last couple of weeks, by Wyoming's current representative. Um, the fact that she is campaigning and, and endorsing Democrat candidates at an absolutely crucial time in our history, I think she has really thrown off the mask. And, and is exposing who and what she is. Now she's she's old news. I get that. I don't tend to talk about her. I'm using her as an example as much as anything else. Um, I think she kind of epitomizes that ruling class. But all across this country, everybody's tired of the ruling class. Yeah. yeah. So yes. Just get the size of these bills down before you get the readable. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I think that the, the best line that I heard from one of our state senators is, if you don't know, you vote no. And that's what we're going to have to, as, as a group, we're going to have to start saying, we're not going to pass this unless we know what is in it. We're not going to pass it unless we understand the moving parts. So Congress has been committing 
what I think, what I would describe as legislative malpractice for quite some time. You put a bill together that is this thing, you're going to have a lot of mistakes and messes in there. The Obamacare bill was 2,500 pages. There are over 20,000 regulations, pages of regulations that have been passed to try to implement Obamacare. I describe Obamacare as the classic example of government always trying to fix its last solution. <laughs> government is always trying to fix its last solution. Obamacare was the be-all and the end-all of everything that we ever needed to do to take care of everybody in the entire world when it came to health care. And all it's done is it's wiped out our insurance companies in Wyoming, it's made health care more expensive, more precarious, and without Obamacare, I do not believe that they would have been able to do to us what they've done to us in the last two and a half years over COVID. They have used our access to health to healthcare as the ability to force us to do things that we don't want to do. And it's because of Obamacare. Well, I'm hopeful that big number of Russians coming in well, I hope that that's what we do too. Yes, sir. The Second Amendment is under attack every day from Washington. More and more, President Biden and his administration are wanting to pass new laws or ordering their ATF to pass regulations that tie the hands not only of FFLs, that's Federal Fire and Licensees, but also individuals. One of the new regulations that has come through has to deal with uh, PMGs, personally manufactured guns. As of August 1st, there is a huge document that was released as a new rule, and that rule, I'm still having trouble with it as an FFL. I'm trying to read my way through it. I'm not a lawyer, and that's written by a lawyer. New laws are not needed. What we need to do is support our current laws. What are your feelings on this? I agree. Yeah, I agree. There's no question that the Second Amendment is under attack. Because if you can do to us what they did in Canada, you can stop us from being able to protest government, right? I mean, we saw. We looked at what happened in Canada with Justin Trudeau six months ago with the truckers. And we were horrified. The Democrats saw it as a roadmap. So we know, what, look what has happened in New Zealand and Australia. Look what they did to those poor folks over COVID and coronavirus. What they did, they disarmed their populace and then they treated them like serfs. And they, they, they threw them in uh, isolation, they, what you see in China. We don't want to be a, a, we have a Second Amendment for a reason. And our forefathers recognized the importance of an armed populace. Not only to keep government in check, but also to we have the absolute God-given right to protect ourselves. Amen. I am a strong advocate for the Second Amendment. One of the first things we need to do is repeal the bill that was the law that was that was uh, passed in July with Liz Cheney's help, and that had to do with expanding the, the number of people who have to get FFLs, free, uh, federal firearm licenses. It also has red flags laws uh, a portion in it with the red flag requirements. It was a bad bill. It never should have passed. It has. We're now going to have to repeal it. Uh, I don't, you know, again, this comes back to limiting government and making sure that it stays in its lane. I do think that much of that bill may very well be found unconstitutional in light of the Supreme Court decisions that came out last term. So I, I do think that that, uh, that that will hopefully, parts of that will be put on the chopping block. But here's the other thing, is the ATF does not have rulemaking authority. Did you know that? <laughs> no, that's the problem. The ATF does not have rulemaking authority. And I know that because I sued them. So my law firm has had two lawsuits against the EPA, or excuse me, the ATF, the EPA too, but the ATF over uh, their bump stock ban. We filed a lawsuit in Texas that is, uh, and then we filed one in Utah and challenging their ability to uh, adopt a, bu a bump stock ban. One of, the, one of the bases of that is that the ATF doesn't have real making authority. So that's what some of the other challenges that we have is that we've got agencies that are just absolutely acting unlawfully. Yes, sir. I would hope that there's a way to do away with the Patriot Act as well, because that's been one of the biggest infringes on we the people, as far as I'm concerned. Along with this change, what did yeah. the NF 
DA or whatever, something like that. The FISA court? No, the defense deal. Oh, the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act? So as far as the Patriot Act, I agree with you. The Patriot Act was obviously passed, and the idea was it was always going to look outward. Well, it's been turned inward, and it is being used. The FISA court, we should not have secret tribunals under our form of government. We should not have secret tribunals. As I've said repeatedly, I've been practicing law for 33 years. I can count on one hand the number of times I have filed documents under seal. We don't operate in the dark in this country. Our tribunals need to be open. They need to be transparent, regardless of how embarrassing it may be or what kind of information is disclosed. And what happened is the FISA court, what happened with Donald Trump and Carter Page and all of that, the FBI used and abused the FISA court, and nobody has yet been held accountable for that. But it is that the Patriot Act has shown to be the risk that a lot of people said that it was, that they were going to start using it against us. And I agree with you that that needs to be looked into. I think we should do away with FISA courts entirely. Under Article III of the Constitution, that's the only judges' courts that we should have, and it doesn't provide for that kind of a private tribunal. Yes, sir. Yes, I've heard some of our Republican leaders in the past say that we're not going to lower ourselves to their level. After seeing what's went on the last couple of years with everything that they've pulled, you know, on committees and everything, are we going to be as ruthless as they were? You know, I'm never going to lower myself to their level because I think that they're absolutely, you know, in the swamp lower than that. But we are going to hold them accountable. And it was the Atlantic this week that issued that. The Atlantic magazine, there was an article in their editorial saying, well, there needs to be amnesty to address COVID and what they did to us. No, 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 no. You're not going to do what you did to our country and our churches and our seniors and our hospitals and our students and our kids and our families. You're not going to do that and then walk in and say, well, never mind. Please be nice to me. It isn't about that. We're going to hold people accountable, including Anthony Fauci, for that. But what we are going to do is the Democrats don't get to play this game right now. What we have to do is they have made such a total and complete mess of things. We've got to go in and fix it. We have to go in and fix it. And we have to deal with Joe Biden. He's the one sitting in the White House. He and whoever is pulling his strings, they're the ones sitting in the White House. But I can tell you that I know that I'm not being sent back there to hold hands with the Democrat. The evidence is there. The people that have, like, drew the vote. And they're in jail right now. They're in jail. And they're in jail. And is there going to be anybody put in jail if we take control? If they question the election? Well, we'll follow the evidence. And the fact is that they should be. If somebody breaks the law, I say yes. The two of the vote people have the evidence. I mean, it's right there. They have the evidence. That's why they arrested the guy. That's why they arrested the guy. So I've got time for one more question. Anyone else? One more? Rick? We're seeing a lot of stuff across the country where the legislators are doing executive orders or not legislating, but by fiat, basically saying, oh, you can't, you have to only drive this kind of car or you have to only use this kind of stove. You can't have boilers in your apartment buildings anymore. You have to change it all to heat pumps. How do we fight against that sort of patchwork? It's sort of like the Second Amendment where every state has different laws and it's very confusing. But how do we stop the states from doing that? Well, the big one is California. And that's the one that you're talking about. They ruined dish soap. They're trying to say we can't have, you know, the dishwashers. You have to run your dishes three times through because they ruined dishwashers. And they ruined toilets. And they ruined so many things with their fiats. One of the problems you have is the EPA has essentially allowed them to do that. That's why you have the Commerce Clause. And that's why for certain things that are going to impact the country, you don't allow a state to come up with their own standards. That's what they have done with California. Congress needs to come back in and say, no, that is, we're not going to allow. 
uh, the, Cal the state of California to be setting standards for to be applied in the rest of the country. You see it in textbooks, and it, in large part, it's because there are 40 million people in California. It's the largest market for any state in the nation. So when they set a regulation, it doesn't necessarily apply to us, but all of the companies are going to follow it because they have to to be able to do business in the state of California. It is a problem. I don't disagree that it is a problem. It is something that I think, again, Congress needs to step up with the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, uh, and, and actually say, no, these are things that have to be dealt with on a federal level. And under the Trump administration, they did. They fought California being able to set standards and were successful. It's one of the things that the Biden administration came in and said, no, we're going to allow California to set standards. But here's something else that legislators around the country did, and this needs to be exposed more. They went in when they were being controlled by Democrats, and they said, whatever California does, the same laws will apply here. Yes. So Virginia is an example of that. So Virginia is now red and being run by a Republican governor and a Republican lieutenant governor and a Republican attorney general. There's a law on the books that to the extent California controls emissions or says that we have to have all electric cars by 2030, Virginia is required by statute to follow suit. Now, hopefully they're going to fix that, but that gives you an idea of the, of, of the kind of octopus that you see um, with the Democrats when they get into power, the kinds of things that we do. And the Republicans are going to have to be as bold and courageous as we, as we can be to undo some of those things. So I think that we're getting ready to go. We're heading back to Cheyenne. Um, I've got a meeting at 9 o'clock in the morning with four conservative school board candidates in Cheyenne. Uh, and then on Tuesday, we've got the election, and Tuesday night, I'm going to head to Denver and fly to D.C. on Wednesday for three days of legal seminars, mostly on the Constitution, so that I can retain my law license, and then hopefully if I win, I will be doing um, <laughs> 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 Again, this is a great turnout. I appreciate your questions and your comments. I will be back. I promise you I will be back. Yeah. Thank you for staying back to go vote. Thank you. Thank you.